You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and I've got five new movies to review for you for the show. First, just let me say that the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of anyone who is airing the station or the station as a whole. With that said, let's get into my first segment, What's Topping the Box Office? The Top 10 Highest Grossing Films of this past weekend. And knocking it from the number one spot for the first time in three weeks is Kingsman, The Golden Circle, which I think is probably the first real film of the fall, or at least in the official fall, since autumn began on... September 22nd, I believe. So, anyway, Kingsman the Golden Circle earned $39 million here in the States and $97.7 million around the world against a budget of $104 million. So it's a relatively modest start for Kingsman the Golden Circle, but I have the feeling that the word of mouth about this film is going to get around pretty fast, just as it did with the second film, uh, the, the film to reach number two, on the box office this past weekend, and that is It. It earned $29.8 million this weekend, and against a budget of $35 million, it has so far grossed $266.1 million in just three weeks here in the States, and $478.1 million around the world, which makes it unquestionably a certified hit here in the States and around the world with a bullet. As a matter of fact, I just heard on the radio on another station that it has outgrossed The Exorcist to be the highest grossing horror film of all time. That is, of course, not adjusted to inflation because tickets were much cheaper in 1973 than they are today. But I'd be interested to see where it falls adjusted to inflation. But maybe I'll do that on a later show. I just don't have time for it today. Otherwise, it would be a very boring show. Number three at the box office this weekend is the Lego Ninjago movie, which is also the second highest grossing film of the week. It grossed $20.4 million here in the States and $30.5 million around the world against a budget of 70, that's 70 million dollars. So it has a very long way to go to recoup its budget, but given that it's an animated movie and the competition is against, I think it's going to recoup its budget and at least be a tentative hit in the next two weeks. That's what I'm predicting. American Assassin was number two at the box office last week when it debuted. This week it fell to number four, having grossed $6.3 million in the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $33 million, American Assassin has so far grossed $26.2 million here in the States and $38.4 million worldwide. Not a very impressive start, but American Assassin is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a tentative hit. Mother, which is continuing to be an incredibly divisive movie, or a polarizing movie, I should say, is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number three, having earned $3.3 million in the U.S. this past weekend. Against a budget of $30 million, Mother has so far in the United States grossed $13.5 million, and around the world it has grossed $26 million. I'll tell you that how I feel about this movie when I get to it later in the show, but... Yeah, this movie is dividing audiences and actually dividing critics as well. In fact, most pe- most audiences hate this movie, but more on that later. Home Again is number six at the box office this weekend, falling from number four last week. Home Again, Home Again grossed $3.2 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $12 million, which is pretty modest, Home Again has so far grossed $24.5 million here excuse me, $22.3 million here in the States and $24.5 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, very close to being a certified hit, but around the world it is already certified. But in every other country besides the United States, Home Again has only grossed $1.8 million, but still certified hit around the world nonetheless, by an inch. 
Friend Request is number seven in the box office this weekend and the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, having grossed $2 million even this past weekend. Against a budget of $9.9 million, Friend Request has grossed so far $8.4 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but particularly around the world is very close to being a tentative hit. Stronger also debuted this week, but it debuted at number eight because of its limited release, having grossed $1.6 million here in the States. That's against a budget of $30 million, but considering that Oscar season is upon us and Stronger is probably going to be released in theaters nationwide very soon, that's still a really good start for the movie, but it has a very long way to go to become even a tentative hit. The Hitman's Bodyguard is number nine of the box office this weekend, sliding from number five last week. It is tied with the largest slide in the top ten, along with the number ten movie. But this weekend, The Hitman's Bodyguard grossed $1.6 million, which isn't much, but against a budget of $30 million, The Hitman's Bodyguard has so far grossed $73.4 million here in the States, and $162.1 million around the world, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And finally, number 10 at the box office is Wind River, sliding from number six last week to number 10 this week, having grossed $1.3 million in its eighth week in release. Against a budget of $11 million, Wind River has so far grossed $31.6 million here in the States, and $38.2 million around the world. So it started out very much like Stronger with a limited release, but when this movie began expanding nationwide into not only art house theaters, but multiplex theaters, the word of mouth got around this movie really quickly. And I think you're gonna hear a lot more about this movie come Oscar season. But in terms of numbers, it is, a, it is most certainly a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And as I said, I think you're going to hear a lot about Wind River come Oscar season. It's, I think it's going to be nominated for Best Picture. It's a little too soon to tell, but I think it's going to be definitely nominated for something, maybe even Best Original Screenplay, because I don't think it's based on a book. But, of course, we'll have to wait and see. And that is my segment, What's Stopping the Box Office? Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is even and gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access TV or some community radio station that's been fortunate enough to pick up this broadcast. Thank you. And or... You are watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on the Boston Free Radio Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Kingsman, The Golden Circle. This is, of course, the sequel to the 2014 surprise box office hit, or at least surprise in the United States. Kingsman... Well, the the movie from 2014, which starred Taron Egerton, Colin Firth, and Mark Strong, amongst other people. So, in this movie, when their headquarters are destroyed and the world is held hostage, the Kingsman journey leads them to the discovery of an allied spy organization in the U.S. These two elite secret organizations must band together to defend a common enemy. The movie is directed by Matthew Vaughn, who 
has directed other such movies as Kick-Ass, X-Men First Class, and also the movie from 2014 with subtitle I Forgot, Kingsman The Secret Service. And this is actually based on a graphic novel, which was just called The Secret Service, but I guess for rights they've, they've called this movie Kingsman, but it works because it's certainly a distinctive title. But Taron Egerton as, is back as Eggsy, whose code name is La um, Lancelot, after adopting that nickname from his mentor, who was played by Colin Firth in the original movie, um, whose real name, his character name, was Harry Hart. Well, something happened to Harry Hart in the original movie, if you saw that, at the hands of the villain in that movie, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Well, eventually, the statesman, who is the, the U.S. top secret secret service that's equivalent to the Kingsman in Great Britain, somehow managed to bring Colin Firth's character back to life. And when they do that, there is actually another threat to the world in the form of actually, in this movie, not a, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, but rather someone who works in the black market, that is the drug trade. And it is an unassuming woman named Poppy, who's play or a seemingly unassuming woman named Poppy, who's played by Julianne Moore. And Julianne Moore is a very unlikely villain. Unlike Samuel L. Jackson, I don't believe Julianne Moore has played a villain, but she plays her usual perky self, but with an edge you have to kind of push to see. And I think uh, Julianne Moore is one of the best parts about this movie because she surprisingly plays evil, not to mention having a facade of being endearing incredibly well. And I, I thought she was delightful to see in this movie, <laughs> even though she's playing a villain. But, of course, Taron Egerton, playing Eggsy again, does really well with his part. Of course, in this movie, he's matured a lot, and he is very much like... Agent J, the Will Smith character in Men in Black, he still has his own way of doing things, but he is a made man. He's an established Kingsman. And there are a lot of characters when the world is held hostage and the Kingsman headquarters are destroyed who get killed near the very beginning. I'm not going to reveal who, but it's actually very shocking considering how well you got to know these characters in the first movie, Kingsman the Secret Service, and just seeing them get offed immediately right when th this movie begins or within 20 minutes of the movie's beginning. But it sets off a good catalyst for Eggsy and code name Merlin, who's played by Mark Strong. A little bit of a spoiler alert, they don't get killed, although you probably knew that Eggsy wasn't going to get killed. But anyway, Eggsy and Merlin eventually <clears throat> travel to the United States where they find the statesmen who are so undercover that probably neither the FBI nor the CIA have heard of them. Or maybe they have, but they're keeping their identity top secret. And amongst the statesmen are a number of American actors who are very much like the, the Kingsmen in the sense that they have, they have code names, only these code names are actually named after alcoholic drinks. There is, if you'll just give me a mo minute to bring the list up, there is Tequila, who's played by Channing Tatum, there is Champ, who's played by Jeff Bridges. There's Whiskey, who's played by Pedro Pascal. And then there's Ginger Ale. I, I guess the pun is a little obvious there, although I don't know why they didn't name this character after an actual alcoholic drink. But either way, she is played by Halle Berry. So the Kingsmen join the statements to take down Poppy, the... Julianne Moore character after she releases a virus that could kill several people in the world. So this, I can't exactly decide whether Kingsman the Golden Circle is better than Kingsman the Secret Service. I haven't really given it that much thought, but what I do know is that I enjoyed this film a lot. If it's not better than the original, it at least complements the original one very well. And it's not very easy for a movie like this to 
to follow the original. For instance, Men in Black 2, which came out five years after Men in Black, was flat out terrible. So terrible, in fact, that I don't believe that Men in Black 3 even wanted to acknowledge the movie's existence. So very few plot elements from that film were picked up for the third. But if they're going to make a third Kingsman movie, which I think at this point they probably will, they have nothing to be ashamed of with this movie. I, and actually, if they wanted to make a Statesman movie with Channing Tatum, Halle Berry, Jeff Bridges, and all the rest, I think that would be a viable spinoff franchise as well. So there are a lot of funny moments in this movie, probably funnier than most films I've seen during the summer. I loved Julianne Moore as a villain. Taron Egerton turned into turned in a very mature but also fun performance, and all the supporting characters were really great, including a semi-cameo by Elton John. So Kingsman the Golden Circle gets my rating of a knockout. Can't decide whether or not it's better than the original, but it certainly complements the original, and it is a very good continuation of a surprise hit from three years ago. They'll challenge your authority because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory, and in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. Hey everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. But if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Mother. This is a movie that came out brand new last week, but for those of you who have been paying attention, I didn't do any new movies last week because I didn't see any new movies last week. And that was mainly because of a family emergency, but now that I'm back at the movie theaters and <laughs> that family emergency, arr, no, I'm just kidding. It, 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 was, it, was, um, it was a week for me to take off from the movies because of those unforeseen circumstances. But anyway, Mother is a movie that I am glad I saw, and I'm glad I'm able to review it for you, although it's a little bit late, because this is probably one of the most polarizing movies that has come out in a while, not only amongst audiences, but amongst critics as well. In fact, audiences I don't even think are really divided. Critics are sort of divided 50-50 by this movie, and audiences just seem to hate it for the most part. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Among them, Mother is a very intense movie, but I don't think it's a bad movie because of that. It is directed by Darren Aronofsky, and if you know anything about Darren Aronofsky's filmography, that is his repertoire, you know that he can direct and write very, very intense films. I haven't seen his debut, Pi, from 1998, but I here it's pretty intense. I have seen Requiem for a Dream, and that is, well, it's not just a movie, it is an experience, and it's, uh, well, it, it's an experience. Yeah, I, I think you could probably tell from my tone of voice what, <laughs> how it kind of shook me up, but yeah, other movies he's directed have had a, a certain amount of shaking you to the core in them. Of course, there was Black Swan and The Wrestler, The Fountain, all very polarizing, maybe, but intense movies nonetheless. And Mother is certainly no exception to that side of Darren Aronofsky. What I'm really surprised about is that this movie got through into mainstream theaters, even though it's more of an art house film, and d didn't seem to have any studio interference among it. And for that reason, I respect the movie a lot. So what is Mother about? It is about a couple's relationship that is tested when uninvited guests arrive at their home, disrupting their tranquil experience. So the mother in this movie, 
who is noted as mother, is Jennifer Lawrence, and she is married to a man who's played by Javier Bardem. And the two of them live a quiet existence in a big house in the middle of the woods. And it's only when a doctor, played by Ed Harris, and his wife, played by Michelle Pfeiffer, come into their home that things begin to go awry. And eventually, their two sons, played by Brian, Glee Brian and Domhnall Gleeson, who are actually brothers in real life, but not the real life children of either Ed Harris or Michelle Pfeiffer, that things really start to go awry. Eventually, the quiet house begins to be disrupted, not only by these family members, who are not related to Jennifer Lawrence or Javier Bardem's characters, but are still occupying their house and overstaying their welcome unquestionably, but eventually, Javier Bardem's character's influence as a poet and as a writer begins to grow, causing more fans of his work to come to their house and overstay their welcome even more than Ed Harris and Michelle Pfeiffer's characters do. So the movie starts to get really, really intense and really, really weird once it's discovered that Jennifer Lawrence's character is pregnant with Javier Bardem's first child. Normally that would be, that, that wouldn't be an intense experience, but with all the exposure that Javier Bardem's character is getting, it begins to take a toll on Jennifer Lawrence's psyche. And there is a lot, there are, is a lot of symbolism going on there. There are certain analogies that can be easily be connected to the Bible, the stories in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, as well as other, other metaphors can be extrapolated relating to certain things, which I, I won't give away. But what I admired about Mother is the really great acting performance by Jennifer Lawrence. Other people can say what they will about her performance, but she is great in this film, particularly because Darren Aronofsky, or the cinematographer of this movie, has a technique of zooming in on Jennifer Lawrence's face. And that could be daunting on a lot of actors, but Jennifer Lawrence has to do a lot of acting with her face and not she doesn't have a lot of lines or not as many lines as you expect. So she has to act without saying very much at all. And that's really, really hard to do, especially when the camera is zoomed in as much on her face as it is. I think sometimes the zooming gets a little bit too much. And yeah, the, the movie is incredibly jarring and at times very hard to watch, but Jennifer Lawrence did an amazing job in this movie. I think this is her best movie to date. She works really well alongside Javier Bardem in this chaotic world that eventually becomes more and more chaotic as they live in it. And, of course, various interpretations of this film can be made. I won't make all of them right now, particularly because I have about an hour, excuse me, a minute and 15 seconds until the next break, but I like this film a lot. I can't exactly say whether it's Darren Aronofsky's best film, but it is certainly not his worst. I don't think he's made a bad film yet to this day, but I admire Darren Aronofsky for creating this film. I, I admire his boldness. I am completely astonished that he was able to make this film without any apparent studio interference, and I applaud him for that. And yes, it is an intense film, and yes, it is an unpleasant experience to watch at various times. In fact, Mother reminded me more of Lars von Trier's films, particularly Antichrist and maybe Necrophilia, than maybe Darren Aronofsky's films like Requiem for a Dream. But Mother, it divides some critics. It didn't divide me, or at least I'm divided into the positive side of the review pool, and it gets my rating of a knockout. It is a bold film. It is a brave film. Jennifer Lawrence has the performance of her career in this movie, and I hope over time people will give this movie more credit than perhaps it's getting right now.
Welcome back to the dog show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch snuggling, ball chasing, face licking, and of course, companionship. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive, and now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, the happy dance will come in with this group. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit theshelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next movie I'm going to be reviewing is Brad Status. This is the latest indie film starring Ben Stiller and has been written and directed by Mike White. And Mike White has acted in and also wrote a number of movies to date, but this is actually his second mainstream, that is, film released in the theaters, that he's directed. The... Uh, the directorial debut he made, he made 10 years ago with a quirky little film starring Molly Shannon called Year of the Dog, which I actually really liked, but he's probably best known for being a writer and an actor in movies on the indie circuit like Chuck and Buck and The Good Girl, and maybe a little bit more mainstream with regards to movies like Orange County and School of Rock. Before, oh, he actually also wrote the Emoji movie. And he was so high in my book, too. But, yeah, the Emoji movie sucked. But moving on, one of the movies that he actually wrote earlier this year that I really liked is one starring Salma Hayek called Beatrice at Dinner. So the fact that he came out with another movie that's not the Emoji movie that he wrote is really impressive. And he also co-stars in this movie, although not so much co-stars as in makes an appearance in this film. But Brad is a father who takes his son to tour colleges on the East Coast, actually in Boston. One of the colleges he visits is Harvard, so there are a lot of shots of, of Cambridge. And meets up with an old friend who makes him feel inferior about his life's choices. So that's the tagline of the movie, but in actuality... Brad, played by Ben Stiller, as I said, it basically feels insecure, not by his one friend, but by several friends who he catches up with on Facebook. These are friends from college. There is a former White House aide who is a regular talking head on TV news. His name is Craig Fisher, and he's played by Michael Sheen with an American accent. There's also a friend of his from college who became wealthy at the age of 40 by selling his tech company and retiring early, named Billy, who's played by Jermaine Clement. There's a hedge fund manager who's also very wealthy, named Jason, played by Luke Wilson. And there's also a movie director friend of his from college named Nick, who's played by Mike White. But unlike the other characters in this film, you don't hear from Mike White's character that often. All you see uh, is him in flashbacks or... Ben Stiller's characters visioning what Mike White's life is like. In fact, a lot of the things that go on in this movie are kind of grand illusions, or not so much illusions as imaginings, that Brad, Ben Stiller's character, has. And, and he almost over-evaluates his own life. He is 
a former journalist who starts his own nonprofit organization and had his one and only employee actually leave the company to work for a for-profit and as this former employee said to Ben Stiller's character, actually make some real money. So Brad is not only supporting his son and helping him get into great colleges, most notably Harvard, but he's also beginning to question his status, not just his social media status, but his life status and wondering how everything went wrong. Of course, what I liked about the overall the narration of Ben Stiller's character is there's really nothing inherently wrong with his life. He's happily married to a woman by the name of Melanie, who's played by Jenna Fisher from The Office, who we actually haven't seen in a while. And he has a son who is a musical prodigy, Troy, who's played by Austin Abrams. And Austin Abrams and Ben Stiller work really well together in this movie. They don't really look alike, so you can't see a passing resemblance, them being father and son, but they have a certain chemistry that you could that only really good actors could have, especially playing two people who are related and who, whose characters have known each other all their life. But as Brad is talking himself down and building himself up again, you begin to see a little bit of a familiarity, especially in this day of people building up their status in life on social media, not just with statuses they put on Facebook or Twitter, but also the pictures they put up that give the illusion to others who view it, whether they want to admit it or not, or whether they intend to have this reaction or not, as everybody is having a good time except me, everybody is traveling except me, everyone is succeeding except me. I have my own radio show on social media, I have these feelings of inadequacy, too. So they are very familiar, but there are certain characters in this movie who set Brad straight. And one of the ones that I thought was the most refreshing was a character who is a Harvard student who Troy actually knew from high school, whose name is Ananya. And she's played by a lovely young actress whose name is Shazi Raha. And not only is Shazi Raha really beautiful, but she actually has moments of profound acting in this film that I wouldn't have expected to see, especially when she's not talking. Because when you first get to know her and Ben Stiller's character takes her out to to lunch along with his son, you begin to see familiarities of a somewhat bombastic and highly opinionated college student. But then when Ben Stiller's character starts to divulge upon how much his life allegedly sucks, you can certainly see familiar facial expressions in Miseraja in this film particularly when you're at a dinner party and you're talking to, or somebody is talking to you and you really just want to get out of their way so ben stiller is is great in this movie he plays a guy who's very self-doubting and you wouldn't expect that from one of the biggest comedy stars in hollywood but i guess that's a testament to how well he plays this insecure guy and inad or uh, who has feelings of inadequacy that he mainly keeps to himself. And I I commend Ben Stiller for having such a brave performance. And Mike White is one of my favorite screenwriters because aside from his more commercial films like the Emoji Movie, when he makes an indie film, he creates really great characters, and he's not afraid to shy away from insecurity. For that reason, Brad's status gets my rating of a knockout. Driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with the text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I used to be a radio DJ in college. I 
really miss those days. Those days are not over. Boston Free Radio puts you back in the station playing your music and broadcasting your views. It's like college, only better. Say goodbye to FCC controls and hello to free speech. BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way, I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on BostonFreeRadio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing is Year by the Sea, which is the screenplay and directorial debut of... Alexander Janko. And Alexander Janko has actually primarily worked in the music department of several films of a wide variety, including Tommy Boy, the movie starring Chris Farley and David Spade, Galaxy Quest, which wasn't a huge hit but has since become a cult favorite, and My Big Fat Greek Wedding. A, a lot of... Uh, movies interestingly enough and he he worked in the music department from approximately 1993 to 2002 he's also composed music for this movie i'm about to review year by the sea and also the girl on the train um my big fat greek wedding the brave little toaster goes to mars and the brave little toaster to the rescue both of which as you can imagine, are direct-to-video films. But anyway, Year by the Sea is actually based on a true story, on a memoir of the same name written by Joan Anderson, and Joan Anderson is indeed a character in this movie. So, Year by the Sea, what is it about? It is a romantic comedy and drama about a woman who, hoping to reclaim who she was before marriage and children, an empty nester retreats to Cape Cod, where she, impar where she embarks upon a quest to set herself free. So this movie was actually filmed on location in Cape Cod, and Joan Anderson, as I said, is played in this movie by Karen Allen, who we haven't seen in a while. The last movie I remember seeing her in was Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, actually her second Indiana Jones movie after Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I liked that Karen Allen was cast in this kind of movie because it seems like a lot of movies about older women, not senior citizen women, but women between the ages of 50 and 65 who are going on a trip to find themselves are either played by two women, Diane Keaton, who is now a senior citizen, but that's another story, or Diane Lane. Diane Keaton or Diane Lane. So it's great to see Karen Allen in a movie like this. She used to do a lot of other romantic comedies, but uh, this one I liked because it didn't feel like one of those Nora Ephron uh, novels where, or a movie like Home Again, which, um, which was d directed by somebody new. Actually, I have the information for Home Again right here. But it, it feels like a Nancy Myers movie. Uh, Home Again does, because Nancy Myers actually produced it. Fortunately, Year by the Sea is a movie that Nancy Myers did not touch, so it doesn't look like a Pottery Barn catalog, which I liked. So, the empty nester Joan, after her one of her sons has gotten married, decides to temporarily separate, but not legally separate, from her husband, who is a very uptight person who believes that the wife is in the family to support the husband. And he actually says that in the film. And, well, she just takes a break from the marriage and decides to go to Cape Cod. And she rents a, a house on one of the islands, which she actually has to get into a rowboat to reach. And this house has electricity, has running water, but has been not particularly well cared for over the last couple of years. And, he, and she also has to heat it using a 
not a, a furnace, but actually a Franklin stove. So it's a little bit more archaic than the life she was used to leading in upstate New York. So she meets a, a number of eccentric Cape Cod residents, including a woman by the name of Erickson, who, or whose last name is Erickson, who's played very well in this movie by an actress named Celia Imrie, who you might remember from the Bridget Jones movies, particularly Bridget Jones' Diary and Bridget Jones' The Heads of Reason, where she played the character Una Alconbury. I haven't seen any of the Bridget Jones movies, but I am just getting that from my resource right here. But one of the complaints about this movie is that it feels like a Hallmark movie, particularly when these characters are just spouting out life mantras as if they're Hallmark cards. It didn't really bother me so much. In fact, I think probably Celia Emery's character is the most, quote-unquote, guilty of doing that. But I did not have a problem with her character. And if I knew this woman in real life, yeah, I'd dance with her on the beach. I can't even dance either. But I really thought this film was delightful. I liked seeing Karen Allen back on the screen again. And again, the this movie could have gone to Diane Lane, but I like the fact that it went to an actress who probably looks more like a real person or doesn't look as glamorous as Diane Lane does. And I, I liked the honesty of the performances. I did think the actor who is playing Karen Allen's husband, whose name I can't exactly find right now, but... I thought he was a little uptight, a little bit too uptight, but eventually I did like the fact that he didn't adjust particularly as well to the Cape Cod life as Joan, as Joan does in this movie. And I, I did think it was, it was realistic for the two to have the, the certain spat in their relationship as they did. And while there were some characters who I think were somewhat fictionalized for the purpose of drama, such as a young, cute shopkeeper named Lucy, who's played by Monique Gabriella Kernan, who has an abusive husband who actually slaps her while customers are there at her store. I, I did think that that trope had been used before, but... It wasn't entirely unwelcome in this film. I, I just really liked watching it. I, I, when these films come out in theaters, I do often think to myself, what's the difference between movies that come out like this and movies that are on the Hallmark Channel, which basically have the same plot? I don't really know. It's something I'll analyze for a later time. But in the meantime, Year by the Sea gets my rating of a knockout. And I just thought Karen Allen did a great job in it. I thought it was true to Joan Anderson's book and also her legacy. The Western Scrub Jay. I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, Arf! Arf! He had spotted the elusive black swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine year old boy, he had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. I love those real sick signs. They're the ones that move me. The thinly blown neurotic toes. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on all Patrick News. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Revolting Rhymes, part one and two. And this is not actually a real movie, as in one that you could go to the theaters and see, but or most people go to the theaters and see, but it was showing at my local Art House Theater and for free for Art House Theater Day. And I gotta say, I really enjoyed 
revolting rhymes quite a bit. The animation style, I wasn't crazy about because I felt like that sort of animation style had been done plenty of times before, the, the CGI, but I did enjoy the rhymes, and I thought they were very true to the original ones written by Raul Dahl. So Revolting Rhymes is in two parts, two 30-minute parts, because this was originally a TV movie for the BBC. But if they wanted to smish or smush both Revolting Rhymes parts together and maybe add all of Raul Dahl's Revolting Rhymes to this movie, I think it actually would be a legitimate movie released in the theaters in the United States that kids would love to see. Maybe there are some comparisons to Shrek here, but I believe that Revolting Rhymes, that Raw Dahl wrote Revolting Rhymes before William Steig wrote the book Shrek. But then again, Raw Dahl wrote this book long before Shrek was even conceived as a movie. But this is two half-hour animated films based on the much-loved rhymes written by Raul Dahl and illustrated by Quentin Blake. And for those of you who don't know Quentin Blake's style, you probably do if you ever picked up a Raul Dahl book. Raul Dahl's books were not fully drawn, but there were pictures instilled here and there from ranging from George's Marvelous Medicine to James and the Giant Peach to Matilda to the witches, you know, the list goes on. Most of Raw Dahl's books were illustrated by Quentin Blake, and I think he had a style of drawing that could be easily compared to the cartoons you see in The New Yorker. And part of me really wanted, based on the fact that I read Revolting Rhymes, in addition to other Raw Dahl books when I was a kid, part of me really wanted the animation style to be like Quentin Blake's drawings. They didn't have to be black and white, although that would have been novel. But yeah, it's had the same sort of scratchy um, drawings that, that Quentin Blake has. And I'm not insulting Quentin Blake. I really like his style. But if that sort of animation were incorporated into this movie, I think I would have appreciated it a lot more. That being said, I do actually think that the CGI animation for these two TV movies was really well done. And there are other films that have been released to theaters that have had much worse animation, particularly Norm of the North. <laughs> Norm of the North has nothing on revolting rhymes in terms of animation or anything else for that matter. So it didn't deviate a lot from Raul Dahl's books, uh, particularly Raul Dahl's takes on several fairy tales of our youth, Little Red Riding Hood, Cinderella, The Three Little Pigs, and the list goes on. They're, they're all here, basically. Oh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is another one. And they're all actually told by a big bad wolf himself who is dressed in a trench, trench coat and is speaking to an old woman about these fairy tales. And this big bad wolf is voiced by Dominic West, who you might know from several movies, but probably most notably from HBO's The Wire, and I think the show that's on Showtime called The Affair, which I have not seen, but I hear really, really good things about it. It's one of those shows that makes me want to have cable television, or at least have a place where I can see it where I don't pay an outrageous subscription fee per month. But Revolting Rhymes being a BBC set of TV movies it includes an entirely British cast, including Dominic West. And what I liked about Dominic West's or the Big Bad Wolf's framing device was it tied the stories together really well in a way I won't reveal. But you know the Big Bad Wolf is on a mission to, well, quench his hunger um, as he's sitting down and telling this old lady these these takes on fairy tales. But again, it, it, it's tied together really well, both his telling the story and the things that are happening outside of the diner where this wolf and this old lady are talking. And it really doesn't do justice to describe what kind of, or what exactly happens in this film, because there are a lot of really good gags. I think it, it follows Raul Dahl's original text very well and 
being that it's called Revolting Rhymes, the rhymes are still there, which I, I certainly appreciate. There was actually one take that Raw Dahl did on the Goldilocks and the Three Bears that did not make it into this film. And I do think that if these films were meshed together and additional scenes were added, I think you could have included all of Raw Dahl's parodies on these, these fairy tales including the three bears and there's one there's one line i remember from the raw dolls take on goldilocks and the three bears which i won't repeat it, it's pretty immature um and when i was 11 years old and i read that that line i thought it was funny and i wanted to see it recreated for the big screen i didn't get a chance to see that but this is a movie that kids will undoubtedly love and uh, adults, I think, will both appreciate the humor because Roald Dahl is one of those universal uh, authors who did write for children, but he didn't pander to them. He didn't look down upon them. And I think that's something that adults appreciated and probably still appreciate as more fans of Roald Dahl are going into adulthood. I'm certainly one of them. So I think that... Even though Raul Dahl was not a big fan of the, the, his adaptations of films that, rather, adaptations of his books that were made into films, I think if he were alive today, he would like Revolting Lock Rhymes, as did I, and it gets my rating. Even though it's a TV movie, it still counts. It's a knockout. I, I again... The, the animation is good, even though it could have been hand-drawn and maybe made to look a little bit more like Quentin Blake, but that's the only grievance I have against Revolting Rhymes. I spend a lot of time in the backyard, and I'm the center of attention at summer barbecues. In 96, I made some of the tastiest s'mores, and in 09, it was me, your backyard fire pit, that accidentally started a wildfire when a summer breeze carried one of my embers into some dry brush. Spark a change, not a wildfire. Visit SmokeyBear.com. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Only you can prevent wildfires. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio, that's one word, dot blogspot.com. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've done the five movies that I'm going to review for you for this show, it's now time to get into my next segment, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the presumed to be the top films that are coming out this coming weekend. The biggest one, or the one that comes first on my list, is a movie called American Made, starring Tom Cruise. And this is a movie about a pilot who lands work for the CIA and and as a drug runner in the South during the 1980s. It's directed by Doug Lyman and also stars Naomi Watts, Dom Hall Gleason, who was just in the movie Mother. And it looks like a movie that might do well, although the fact that Tom Cruise has one of the worst films of the year, The Mummy Under His Belt, it might not. But then again, Doug Lyman is the director of such esteemed movies as the original Bourne trilogy, The Bourne Identity from 2002, The Bourne Supremacy from 2004, and The Bourne Ultimatum from 2007. And also he directed Tom Cruise in Edge of Tomorrow, which most people believe to be a really solid action film. Maybe this will pull Tom Cruise out of his rut that he's experiencing right now maybe but i will see this movie this coming weekend and i will let you know what i think on next week's show another movie that's coming out is a remake of flatliners flatliners you might remember as being the movie from 1990 directed by joel schumacher and starring julia roberts Kiefer sutherland and kevin bacon amongst other people oliver platt was also in the movie as was billy baldwin but in this remake of flatliners 
Five medical students obsessed by what lies beneath the confines of life embark on a daring experiment by stopping their hearts for short periods. Each triggers a near-death experience, giving them a first-hand account of the afterlife. So that is the exact same plot as the 1990 movie. And this time, the med students include Ellen Page, Diego Luna, Nino Dobrev, and James Norton, amongst other people. So I'm interested to see this film because I actually did like Flatliners, even though it was directed by Joel Schumacher, who's been hit or miss in, in a lot of instances. He's been hit with movies like Flatliners, 8mm, and... Batman Forever, but he's been missed when it came to movies like St. Almost Fire, The Wiz, which he didn't direct, but he wrote the screenplay for, and, of course, Batman and Robin, which was the blaring movie that, unfortunately, man, that was that was painful to watch, but I think it's kind of coming back as, as a cult film that's so bad it's becoming good, but I still attest it's really, really bad. But... Joel Schumacher has nothing to do with this Flatliners remake. I, I think it's a mistake to make a movie that that's already based on a good movie, but then again, the original Flatliners was flawed. I liked it because I thought it was at least enjoyable to watch, and certain moments of it made sense, but I, I would be interested to see how Flatliners is, the, the remake, and I will let you know when I do my show next week. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend may be... It's going to be a movie that is in limited release, but it's a movie called Till Death Do Us Part, and it stars a largely African-American cast, including Tay Diggs, Annie Ilonze, and Malik Yoba, amongst other people. It's about Michael and Madison Rowland, who have planned to spend the rest of their lives together, I, I assume Madison is a woman, until one day Michael's controlling ways turned their perfect marriage. With the help of her best friend, Madison decides to get away. After adopting a new identity, she meets Alex Stone and learns to love again. All is well until Michael discovers Madison's whereabouts and recreates the nightmare she once lived all over again. And now, I was just talking about Flatliners being a remake of a Julia Roberts movie. Till Death Do Us Part sounds like the exact same premise as Sleeping with the Enemy, which was the 1991 film, which was okay, that starred Julia Roberts. It was a little bit hammy. I thought Julia Roberts did well in the movie, but the, the guy who played her abusive husband, eh, not so much. He was, he, he was a little too in, incredible for me, and I, I mean incredible in the, the, the least best way. But Till Death Do Us Part, I, it might be in a theater near me, it might not be, but I'll let you know if I see it, what I think. But that just about does it for this edition of Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I'm here to tell you again that the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the reviews of any individual who works for the station that's airing this broadcast or for the station or of the station as a whole. With that being said, I've got a great I've had a great time reviewing movies for you for this show, and fortunately, all the movies I reviewed for you have been knockouts, which doesn't happen very often. I am a stickler for those kind of grades. I don't give them to everyone, but until next week's show, I'll see you at the movies.